good morning or good afternoon. And thank you everybody for attending the link.net user groups um, monthly events. Uh, tonight's event is with Jim Ridiculous. And Jim Ridiculous uh, is a very well known civil art MVP. And he works for Winter Direct as a, <coughs> as a consultant. Anyways, before I hand over the reins to Jeremy, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping chores. Uh, coming up more or next in July is another Jim Lickness um, event, and that is the Tale of Two Stacks, Windows 8. Then we have John Garland on July 24th. And in August, we have two more. We will be having a total of eight um, events with uh, together with Vincelet in the coming couple of months. So be aware that uh, there will be quite a few events um, coming in. Uh, a few other things. I want to thank um, Sync Fusion and Vincelet for the fantastic support they have been have been giving us in driving um, the, this event and also let you know that there is a, a partner offer from Intellect uh, that will be a lucky winner today of a Intellect virtual training course um, valued at $499. The winner will be announced today uh, during the webinar uh, at, at the end. Now two things, A, you have to be a Linux member. Uh, two, you also have to be present to win. Secondly, Sync Fusion are also giving away free sample, free copies of their Metro uh, Metro Studio. Uh, Metro Studio is a um, an application where you can get a ton of icons, Metro style. You can edit and modify them to different styles for Windows 8 development or Metro development. Last but not least, um, here are our details. Be aware that the Linux members is LinkedIn members. Uh, so if you want to have a chance to win today, head on over and set up linkedin.com slash groups. And it's group ID 43315. I'll hand it over now to Jeremy. Jeremy, thank you very much for coming back again. Uh, this is the second time you were presenting for us at Linux. That is correct. I'm going to give you the reins. Okay, let me pop over. Let me know once you see that slide, and I will dive right in. I see it already. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to be here and share these top ten features of Windows 8 Metro. As uh, Brian was kind to mention, I'm a, a Silverlight MVP, and this new platform is the one that I've been diving into uh, since... Uh, we all know Silverlight has shifted in popularity a bit over the, the recent years, and so I, I moved on to this platform very early in the stages, uh, right when the Build Conference came out. I think I was one of the first to download and install and, and work with this. And um, one of the things that's taught me is how to rewrite software three times as we went from the release preview to the, or actually the developer preview to the consumer preview to the release preview, but it has been a, a fun experience, and I'm going to share some of those features. Before we kick off, I do want to point out that I am running this off a of Samsung Series 7 slate, so I thought some people would find that interesting because we will run some interactive code samples and build those from Visual Studio, and this is all being done on the slate. And in fact, one of the complaints I've heard about Windows 8 was the lack of a start menu, and I think that the uh, start menu really is not missing, it's just different. And if I want to get to system info from this point, it's really just a couple key taps because the default from the start menu on Windows 8 is to start an application search. So I'm going to pull up my system information real quick. So there we go. I've uh, hit the window key, typed the search, and pulled it up, and it's just as easy as that. And you can see I've got my Samsung Series 7 slate that we're running this off of. So 
So a little bit about the company I work with, uh, Wintelect, a, a sponsor of this event as well. We're a consulting, training, design, and debugging company. And, and I believe many people on this call should be familiar with some of the founders, Jeffrey Richter, Jeff Proceis, and, and John Robbins. So they've uh, pretty well known in the .NET community. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that in this talk as well. So we provide the, the consulting side. We give training. We provide design and debugging. And another important thing that we offer is a dis dev discovery conference. So that conference this year is going to take place in Houston, October 1st through October 3rd. And uh, think of this more as a intense hands-on training experience. It's not so much a conference as it is the, the same trainers who train Microsoft, uh, basically pulling in a select group of people and going into deep dives on various technology stacks. So you can see that wintelect.com forward slash devscovery will give you the details there. As mentioned, too, we have a, a couple giveaways here. The first is the Wintelect virtual training course, and I'll give you the link to see what those training courses are. If you're a LidNug member and you're on this uh, talk right now, we will draw a name that I will announce at the end and give you details to pick up that training. And then Sync Fusion has offered this massive collection of icons to download. So we'll talk about that, and I'll provide that link as well. So let's give a rough agenda over the next uh, 80 or so minutes. What we're going to cover is, is what I call the top ten features. These are the things that when I moved onto this platform, and I was like everybody else, I was scared. You know, what was happening with Windows 8? Is Silverlight going to be dead? Am I going to be able to use XAML technology? Is C Sharp even an option? And when I jumped into the environment and started writing code, I realized, wow, there's a lot here. And so these are ten things that really popped out. And time permitting, I've also got a bonus item. So I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Spinal Tap, but we'll kind of take that volume dial that normally goes to ten and maybe add an eleven here. And we'll see if we can fit that in and, and get an eleventh item that I'm, I'm excited about. So to start off with, I wanted to set some context, though, and talk about where we are at. What is this Windows 8, and where did it come from? Because it really started 30 years ago. And I'm always a little, uh, I guess, reserved about bringing this up in a talk because it, it shows my age, and I know there may be people who weren't born when this version of the operating system was out. But this was 1981. It was codenamed MS-DOS Executive, and MS-DOS is the Microsoft Disk Operating System. And one interesting thing about this first version of Windows was there were no overlapping tiles. So they could be tiled, but you couldn't actually take a window and overlap. That was fixed about a decade later when we had this version, the Windows 3 version, which a lot of people consider the first serious version. It came with a lot of things besides the, the visuals that you see here with the overlapping windows. We got virtual memory. We got virtual device drivers. We got protected mode, which at the time was needed to access a bigger chunk of memory. And we were talking in terms of megabytes back then, not gigabytes. And then we've got this uh, functionality of cooperative multitasking. <laughs> And cooperative multitasking is not what we're used to today. That was a multitasking that said someone's going to take control, and then someone else can step in when they choose to give up the control. And that's as opposed to preemptive multitasking where the threads are, are interweaving with each other. So the next evolution here was this version of Windows, which was really marketed as the first version that was Windows first. In other words, you didn't boot to DOS and load Windows. You went straight into Windows. And what a lot of people don't realize is this version still okay. sat, I'm still, stop. still sat on top of the MS-DOS operating system. And beyond that, this was the version where we started to see longer file names, plug and play, and true 32-bit development. Now we move on to Windows XP. Windows XP was a version that merged two tracks. So there was a consumer track of Windows operating systems, and then there was a server track. 
and this was the NT followed by the Server 2000. And what Microsoft did was combine these technologies into a single version. And it was basically well known for being very stable. It had code protection. It started to support DLL versions, so you didn't have these assemblies that were conflicting with each other. And this is where we started to see the true preemptive multitasking. That was followed by an operating system that many people would love to possibly forget. And uh, that one was called Windows Vista. And people will recall when this operating system first came out, there were a lot of, of issues with that. And really by the second service pack, which is when I adopted this operating system, it, it was very stable, very well to use. But in the beginning, there were a lot of kinks. However, this is what brought us this concept of Arrow and the, the semi-transparent windows. It gave us a, a more powerful built-in window shell, gave us speech recognition, it gave us the dream scene, which was these animated backgrounds that people thought were really cool until they tried to do something with their computer. And then they realized it took up so much CPU, you had to stop the animations. And then we had our, our favorite, the, the user access control, where every installation you get a prompt that says, do you really want to install this? So the response to that was Windows 7, which by appearance looks very similar to what Windows Vista was. Uh, I've heard it said that Microsoft took everything that was wrong about Vista and fixed it and came out with Windows 7. This had a very positive reception. It had a fairly fast adoption. Most people are jumping from XP directly to Windows 7. Windows 7 provided the first native touch capabilities, so built into APIs. It gave us handwriting recognition. It gave us virtual hard disks and improved multi-core support. So a lot of uh, leaps to this version. Now we have the new Surface that everyone's talking about. And this is Windows 8. And I'm going to talk about the development side. So what is this experience like to develop for this operating system? But there are a lot of features from the user and the consumer side that are important to understand. We're back to a start screen that does not have overlapping tiles, for example. But what's changed is instead of an icon that just sort of sits there and waits for you to click on it, we've got these live tiles that at a glance provide information so I can get my context just at a glance. And then if I want to learn more, I can click through and drive into what I want to see. Now, on top of these different versions of the operating system, we've had some iterations of technologies. And I think this is a book I've seen on a lot of people's shelves if they've been programming Windows for some time. And one of the earlier technologies was this Win32 API, which was an unmanaged API for building Windows applications. We also had a mature version of Visual Basic, which is an event-driven language and supported a full interactive development environment. And it really sat on top of COM and helped build some COM technology, which is the, the next technology I want to talk about. This is Common Object Broker. This is actually a reference to a suite of technologies. We've got OLE, ActiveX, COM Plus, DCOM, et cetera. It is basically a standard for creating modules and software components that communicated with each other. Anyone who's worked with COM knows it was not easy and straightforward, but eventually you could wrestle with it and get it to do the things that it promised. Of course, what I'll call a game changer in the history of Windows, and something that created a lot of fear when Windows 8 was announced, is the .NET Framework. And so there were actual rumors that the .NET Framework would not even exist on Windows 8 machines, which is, is not the, the full story. So the .NET Framework gave us this concept of an intermediate language. It gave us managed code so developers no longer had to worry so much. I mean, it is still a concern, but about managing memory, allocating memory, releasing memory. It gave us some advanced garbage collection to manage that for us. And it also provided multi-language support. And I'm talking about programming languages. So we have a plethora of ways that we can build. Now, I list C Sharp here because that's the language that I've been using for quite some time. But there's a whole suite of other languages that are available through the .NET framework.
<clears throat> on top of that, on that framework, we got Windows Presentation Foundation. And this really changed the game for several reasons. As a presentation framework, it moved us from an older graphics drive device interface to something called DirectX, which is a more advanced way of interfacing with graphics. It gave us the concept of vector-based graphics so they could scale well to different resolutions. It gave us 3D rendering. It introduced typography so things like ebook readers were much easier to implement using the built-in typography of the system. It gave us animations, and most importantly, I would argue, this was the introduction of data binding and XAML. And so this was a declarative way to instantiate an object graph, most often the UI tree for your application, and use this concept of data binding to allow us to create a parallel developer and designer workflow. On top of that, this concept was extended to the language that was initially promised as a multi-platform sort of trimmed down version of the .NET framework. And this is the book that when it was released turned me into an instant historian because by the time I started writing it until the time we released it, Silverlight sort of gained momentum with uh, version 5 and then dwindled in, in popularity. And it's, it's we're not going to hide the fact that a lot of application development is going in other directions. But part of the story I want to share is everything I put into that book and that technology is usable on the Windows 8 platform, and we'll talk about that. Of course, the big contender was HTML5. And if nothing else, what we have to give HTML5 credit for is incredible marketing. When this technology started to emerge, everyone was convinced that we'd finally solved the problem of writing an application once and having it run everywhere. Now, we know today that's not the case but it is an evolution in the right direction. There are a lot of good things about HTML5. It's just a new specification, and there's a lot of standards being put into place, and it hasn't really delivered on the promise that we could have a rich, offline, disconnected application experience using HTML markup. So then the final evolution of technology that I'm going to talk about is this Windows runtime that ships with Windows 8. And this is what I'm saying is the best of all worlds. Underneath that runtime, there are calls that look like our traditional Win32 calls. There are concepts related to COM. There's even a version of the .NET framework. So all of these technologies have come into play with Windows 8, and we're going to cover a little bit about what that means over these next features that I introduce. So the first feature I want to talk about is development language support. And this is something, again, that there was some trepidation about before Windows 8 was announced, and that was, what will I use to write code? And there was speculation it might be only HTML and JavaScript, and there was also speculation it might only be unmanaged code. And what actually happened was this release came out and supported a plethora of languages. So you've got native support with C++. You've got the .NET framework support with C Sharp and Visual Basic. And then you've got web support, which is important because it allows web developers or people who spend most of their time in web development to take those same skills and apply them to developing Windows 8 applications through HTML and JavaScript. Now, you see in parentheses there, I mentioned Trident and Chakra. So these are the internal engines that drive the rendering and the JavaScript for Internet Explorer. And these are the same engines that drive the rendering and the interpretation of code in the Windows 8 platform. It's a specialized version, and we'll talk about that. So what I want to do is show you how this language support works, and I want to create an application starting with my favorite language, which is C Sharp. So you can see I've got Visual C Sharp Windows Metro style here. And we're just going to call this Hello World C Sharp. And I'm just starting with a blank application template. And now my template is created. So the first thing anyone 
familiar with WPF or Silverlight will notice is I've got XAML in this application, just like I'm used to, and I've got C-sharp code behind. This is the language I'm used to working with. So I can easily go into this main page, let the designer spin up here. I think if I wiggle my mouse pointer the right way, we can speed this up a little bit. Let's see if we can make that happen. All right, we're not going to let it catch up with us. There we go. So what I've got is a design experience with a tablet here and a surface to draw on. So I'm just going to add a very simple element down here. I'm going to add a text block. We'll give it the name Hello Text. So that's just a text element. And then in the code behind, once this component is initialized, I'm simply going to take that Hello Text and add Hello World. So let's make sure this builds. And let's go ahead and execute that. And I've got my Hello World. And it's actually a little bit small, so let's go ahead and do something we're also familiar with from Silverlight and WPF. And let's go ahead and add a style. So in that text block, I'm just simply going to say style equals static resource. And we'll call it a subheader text style. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So we'll rebuild, launch it on our Windows 8 slate here. And you get Hello World and a little bit easier to read text. So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and close this application. And I can still use Alt F4 like I'm used to from Windows 7. I'll stop the debugger. So I'm going to copy this XAML. So we'll just copy it out right there. Okay. And now I'm going to do a new project. And this time I'm going to select Visual C++. Windows Metro style blank application. And I'm going to cleverly name this Hello World C++. So we'll click OK. We'll let it spin this up. Now, I have to admit, I started some of my programming career with C++, but it's been quite a while since I've worked heavily within it. But I do know enough to recognize, for example, a header file that's over in the right here, this pch.h, and a CPP for a C++ file. So the first thing I want to show you is if we go into that main page and let it spin up the designer again, I'm going to paste the XAML I took from my C-sharp application. So this is the exact same XAML that we had in the C-sharp side. I'm just going to go ahead and build the solution. So we'll let that spin through, and you can see this time we're doing some C++ compilation. And we'll let it spin through, main page, XAML type info, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so what I'm allowing it to do is to take the XAML and project it so that I can reference it from the code behind in the C++ code. And it looks like we have a successful build. So let's go into the C++ code. And this time, using C++ syntax, we're going to take the hello text. And I believe we access it like this to say, Hello world. And let's see if that works. So again, going through a compile cycle, deploying it, and we're almost there. Hello world. So we got the exact same output, but this time using a C++ application. So now what's probably most interesting to a lot of people who are curious and, and haven't toyed around with the platform is we're going to create a project. Let's go ahead and stop the debugger here. 
And this time we're going to create a JavaScript project. So we're going to come down here to JavaScript, pick a blank application, and again, if you can guess the clever name I'm going to use uh, my hat off to you, it's going to be Hello World JavaScript. So I'll click OK there. Let it spin through and create my structure, and what you'll immediately recognize in the structure is instead of code and code behind in XAML, what I'll have instead are web pages, like this default.html, and JavaScript, which is the exact JavaScript I'm used to, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this talk, so bear with me. But let's go ahead and take this paragraph tag. Let's get rid of the content inside of it. Let's give it a class, and we'll give it win type x large. So that's going to style it for us, and let's give it an ID of hello text. So I just gave that tag an identifier, and then in this default.js, what I'm going to do is when we're activated, simply going to say hello text inner text equals hello world. So let's see if we can make this work. And we get hello world this time in the context of a JavaScript application. So you can see that I've got all of these similar templates that I'm able to work with if I go back to my new project dialog. I can work with a grid application, and you can see some of the thumbnails on the side for that type of application, a split application, and these templates are available across the different languages in the set. Let's go ahead and close this out. And let's talk about something that you just saw, which is the XAML support. So we've got XAML support in C++ and in C Sharp. Now what's interesting is the Windows 8 platform supplies controls that are native controls. So these are highly performant controls, some of them projected directly from the operating system itself, but they are mapped into the XAML. And this is done through a feature called projection, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I can access them as if they're typical XAML controls. They're mostly compliant. When I say mostly compliant, there's not 100% parity between the XAML version for Windows 8 and Silverlight and the phone, etc. But that's to be expected because they're different environments and form factors. There's a limited feature set, meaning some of the more advanced XAML features we're used to, like markup extensions, for example, are not available. But it does provide native data binding. So this is a very low-level, high-performance data binding. And I've given you this example of code that can really be the same for WPF, Silverlight, and Windows 8 within XAML. But what I wanted to show you with this Silverlight style of Metro is just how close the XAML does match what we're used to. So what I'm going to do is create a new project. And I'm going to make it a C-sharp project, again, a blank application. I'm going to call it button example. So you can see I've got my template. And inside this template, I'm going to go ahead and just create a very simple button. So we'll say button content equals click me. And we'll go ahead and center it. OK. So now we've got our designer up. We can see the button in the designer. We can run this application. Let it build it out, deploy it, pull it up. And we get a metro style button in the middle that I can click. So a little boring, but we have limited time, so I didn't want to go into a, a full-blown enterprise solution here. But what I want to do that I think you'll find interesting is let's pull up Internet Explorer. And let's just do a quick search for Silverlight button template. And what we land on is button styles and templates on MSDN. So this is Silverlight documentation, 
and it gives us the template in Silverlight for a button. So let me just go ahead and copy this. Do a copy, go back into my Visual Studio. I'm going to add a resource section to my grid. So let's do grid resources. And let's paste that in. Now what you're going to find is I do have a few squiggly lines, which we know squiggly lines are never good. But these are just because the namespace for the Visual State Manager has changed. So what I'm going to do is just come over here. Uh, let's do a quick Control F. And we're going to search for VSM colon and get these instances, and we're just going to simply remove them because I can directly reference the Visual State Manager in this Metro template. So that's the only change I'm doing is just simply removing this namespace prefix. And you can see now I've got something valid, and in the designer, my button is styled differently. Let's go ahead and run this. So we'll compile it out, let it deploy. And now we get a button that looks very suspiciously like what we're used to in Silverlight. So the point of this little demonstration was just to show you that although there are differences, there are a lot of similarities. And that same technology that I've been using to style templates and style buttons and so forth uh, is still valid and relevant here in the Windows 8 world. So when we move over to HTML5 and JavaScript, what we're dealing with is, is HTML5 tags and, and markup. So instead of using XAML for our UI markup, we switch and we use HTML5. Now what's interesting is this is a, a fully supported set of markup tags that you can use. And you can see by the example here that they're the divs and the, the classes and the H4 that you're used to using. They're CSS support. So the styling works through CSS like you would be used to. And there's JavaScript support. Now what's important about the JavaScript support is that it is true JavaScript. This means you can pull in a third-party library that you're used to working with, and you can integrate it directly into your application. So that's a pretty powerful feature. And the way that's done is through this WinJS. WinJS is you could call it an extension to the JavaScript runtime in Windows 8 applications. What it does is it provides exposure to the underlying Windows runtime APIs. And so when you see this data wind control, for example, that uses the binding template, it's using an HTML5 compliant extension that tells the runtime to wire in this actual control to that markup that you're using with HTML. And so to show how these third-party libraries can be used, I want to do a similar example to my Hello World one. But I'm going to use jQuery instead, which is not out of the box. So let's call this uh, jQuery Metro. So we're going to create a new application. Let me make sure it is a JavaScript application. We'll start with a blank, and we'll click OK. And we'll let it spin up that same default structure that you're used to seeing. Again, I'm going to go into my default page. I'm going to take this, uh, the P content goes here. I'm going to add this class so we can actually see it when I run this. And I'm going to give it the ID of hello text. So when I go into my JavaScript right now, and I try to do a jQuery selector, I'm not really going to get anything because there's, there's no support yet. So what I'm going to do is go into the package manager. And so if you're familiar with NuGet, NuGet is supported out of the box in Visual Studio 2012. So we can go into the package manager console, and that's pulling up right down here. And we can simply say install package jQuery. So that's going out to NuGet saying, I want this jQuery script package. And it's pulling down all of the re relevant files and loading them into my project.
Okay, great. So now we see that jQuery is here under scripts. So let's go into the default page. And let's go ahead and add a reference, script source equals. And if IntelliSense was behaving, I suspect I would actually be able to browse to this. But I'm going to guess that we're going to do scripts slash jquery-1.7.2.min.js. dash one dot seven dot two dot min dot js. And we'll close the script tag. So this is pulling in the jQuery. Then we'll go to the default. And this time we'll use a jQuery selector. And now you see I'm getting IntelliSense. I'm getting auto completion. So let's go ahead and pick an element here. And it's going to be the hello text element. And then we're just going to call the text function. And we're going to say hello from jQuery. Now again, this is a fully functional Windows 8 Metro application. I just installed jQuery. I'll go ahead and launch that. And we get hello from jQuery. So we're able to pull that library in without modification and use it here in our Windows 8 environment. So let me terminate that. Come back here. So all of these demos have been operating off the Windows runtime. This is the new runtime that's a part of Windows 8. So it draws from common.net, but does it in a way that makes it very easy to use. A lot of the runtime is unmanaged code, but you can create your own managed components. And this is all done magically by the operating system for you. There's something called projections that make these components accessible from any language environment. So whether you're using JavaScript or whether you're using C Sharp or C++, you get access to the same components. The components that are built in also make tasks very easy. I can literally spin up a web camera, have the user tap a snapshot, crop the picture, and save it to SkyDrive in about a half a dozen lines of code. So it's a very rich set of features that this exposes. Now this is the platform that Windows Runtime operates on. So you see this Windows Core, and then you see the layers on top. So there's a, a XAML layer, there's a Pickers, Controls, MIDI, etc. And then you can see down the right side, there's different types of language support for these features. And what's interesting is this green square that you see on the left that says Windows Metadata and Namespace. This is where I say Windows 8 is drawn on sort of the, the best features from different technologies. Because even when you write a component using C++, what happens is the Windows runtime generates a metadata file that contains the signature for that component. And it does it using the same specification that .NET uses to describe types. So it's the very same specification. You can look it up online. I um, haven't quite memorized the number yet, but it basically allows you to take IL disassembler, which we're used to using to inspect assemblies, and look at the signatures for Windows runtime components. So it makes it very easy for these other language components to query the metadata and understand how to talk to these components that you create. The automatic mapping is also powerful. So in the Windows runtime, there's a Windows runtime version of a string. There's a Windows runtime version of an event. All of this is automatically mapped. And the best example I can give you is in the Windows runtime, when you register for an event, you get a special token for that event. And when you want to unregister the event, you just pass that token to the unregister call. Now, this is not how we're used to operating in .NET. So the, the uh, .NET version, we basically add a delegate and subtract a delegate. So how does that map to the Windows runtime? Well, what happens is it will spin up the code necessary behind the scenes so that when you do a plus equal for a delegate for an event, it's going to put out the code that gets the token, stores the token in a dictionary. So when you do a minus equals to subtract the delegate out of that event, it will actually unregister with the token. These are the type of features that are built in so that you don't even have to know that about events. I just added some extra information there, but that's the runtime working for you. 
So I want to show this quick demo of just how powerful this is. We're going to create another JavaScript application. And we're going to call it, let's say, JavaScript with C Sharp. That sounds like a good name. So I'm going to let that spin up. And again, in my default page, I'm going to take this content, give it an ID. Let's call it Hello Text. Let's give it a class. It's the class we know we can see when type extra large. So we've just tagged that. Now I'm going to come up here to my solution, and I'm going to add a new project. But instead of JavaScript, I'm going to come up to C Sharp, and I'm going to pick a Windows Metro style, <coughs> excuse me, runtime component. So let's call this My Component. So again, C Sharp Metro style runtime component. So we'll spin that up. And we've got a project here, and you can see this project is using C Sharp. One rule for creating Windows runtime components is that they must be sealed. You cannot derive from those components. So I'm going to rename this class. I'm just going to call it my class. And then I'm going to provide a public method called get welcome text. And in that public method, I'll return string format hello from C sharp at and give it a daytime now. So I'm using a C sharp .NET string format feature. I'm using the C sharp daytime object and I'm returning that from my component. So let's go ahead and build this. And then I'm going to do something that you probably haven't seen very often, and that's I'm going to go into a web JavaScript project, and I'm going to add a reference to a C-sharp component. So my solution, I'm going to check this My Component and click OK. So I've got that reference I'm going to build one more time just for good luck with that reference. And now let's go ahead and jump in here. And what we want to do is we want to take that hello text. Uh, actually, let's create the component first. So my component equals new, and it was my component. You can see the IntelliSense there, dot my class. So I'm creating an instance of that class. And then I'm going to say hello text dot inner text equals my component dot you can see I've got get welcome text, and it's also been transformed. We're used to this uppercase format in C Sharp. We're used to the lowercase format in JavaScript. So it's all automatically been mapped that way for me. So let me do that, and let's run it. And there you have it. It's a JavaScript application that is referenced a C-sharp Windows runtime component. So the next feature that I want to dive into is this concept of contracts. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, if you followed me at all online, you know that I'm a big fan of a technology called MEF. And that's uh, short for the Manage Extensibility Framework. And what that technology provides is a way to extend and modularize applications. In Silverlight, we use it quite a bit for dynamic loading. And I used to always compare it to other inversion of controller dependency injection containers by saying most of those solutions allow you to code for what you know, whereas MEF allows you to code for what you don't know. In other words, you write a contract, and then you don't necessarily know what might implement that down the road, but it can get pulled in. Well, this is handled at the operating system level in Windows 8. So you've got this ability to activate applications using contracts. There's a launch contract. When you're on the start menu and you click on a tile, that activates the launch contract. There's a search contract for integrated search. 
We've got consistent settings, which we'll talk about in a bit, and we've got sharing. There's templates provided in Visual Studio. So if you want to implement one of these contracts, you can use that template. And it provides extensibility by sharing to applications you don't even know about. And so I'm going to give you an example of that here in a second. So let's pop to my Windows 8 start screen, and let's just pull up Internet Explorer, for example. So I'm on Bing. And uh, I've got a chicken page, so now you've uh, learned what my uh, search results are going to be, but that's okay. I'm just going to highlight some text and pull up the search charm. The charm bar is over here on the side. I'm going to click on share. So I pulled up the charm bar and share. Now, it gives me some options. I can go to my Twitter client. I can go to my mail client. So if I click on my mail client, it's going to pull that open, and it's going to pull in that shared content. And let me go ahead and, and email that off, or I can go back and change my mind and make a different choice. What's important is Internet Explorer did not know anything about the mail application. It simply exposed what it was sharing, and that application picked it up. But let's go for a little bit better example. Let me go into my photos. My pictures library. And you've already seen this. I'm going to have you bear with me just a few more moments as I pull up this picture. Let's go ahead and pull up the share bar. Now we're sharing a photograph. And you'll see some other applications have come into play. Puzzle Touch is an application that makes puzzles. Knew nothing about the fact that I was giving this talk today. But if I go ahead and click on this application, it's going to ask me what type of puzzle I'd like to create. So I'll say easy. It's going to spin up. We'll see the little circles. And it says my new puzzle's ready. Well, what does that mean? Let's close out of this application. And let's go into Puzzle Touch. So we'll find it right over here. And what's happened is that ability to share has allowed Puzzle Touch to pull up a puzzle from the picture that I just shared out. I'm not going to bore you with seeing my feeble attempts at trying to solve the puzzle real time, but you get the point. There's little pieces of me all over the display. And that was a pretty seamless interaction. The other thing I'll show you is this concept of integrated search. So I can pull up the search, and by default it goes into applications. You saw when I pulled up my system information how quickly that happened. So I'm going to search for chicken. You saw that before. Now, there's no apps that match chicken. But on my file system, I actually have some images because I've got an application installed where the word chicken is in the name of those images in that application. So that's a little bit interesting. What about this cookbook? So I've got a cookbook application. If we click on that, it's going to pull up, and it's going to show me recipes that have chicken inside of them. If I go to Internet Explorer, it'll default to a Bing search. And if I go to dictionary.com, I'll get the definition of chicken. Heck, I can even go into the news and figure out what the latest chicken news is, although I don't think I would do that on a regular basis. Let's let this spin up and, and show us that. So the fake chicken that could fool a hen right there, live uh, a demo, folks. Let's say I was searching for something else like a sofa. Well, with the sofa, Wintelect created an application for rooms to go that you might have seen in the TechEd keynote. And this enables their sales representatives to carry a slate onto the floor and work with the customer to look at inventory to see what's available, matching items, et cetera. And you can see my search went directly into this application, and then I can drill down, pull up an item, take a look at that, and perform different features and functionality. So that is the power of what contracts provide. It's an API that lets you write to something that hasn't even been implemented yet. Asynchronous support is huge, and this is not specific to Windows 8, but it comes with the, the Windows 2012 RC, and a lot of the Windows 8 APIs are asynchronous. So what we used to have to do is follow one of the existing models, like the asynchronous programming model, or APN. And if you're familiar with that, you called a method with begin. You got kind of a token. You waited till it ended. Then you called an end method and got some more information. And then the more 
commonly used method these days, I believe, is this event-based mechanism. So you register for when an event completes, and then when it's completed, you do something. The problem with this is if you have a lot of sequential operations, then you're finding yourself using 10, 12, 20, 30 methods for each one of those operations. Or you're using lambda expressions, and your code gets really ugly really quick. So what asynchronous support does is it provides the async modifier that is sort of the intent. This method is going to handle something asynchronously. The other thing it provides is a way to wait for that asynchronous task to complete. And in this example, you see the new style where inside of this console write line, I can actually wait for some sort of asynchronous task to complete. I don't have to take this, put it in a state object, register for a completed event, come back, pull it out. I can do it right in line, which makes my code very clean and easy to organize. I've got four different possibilities in Windows 8 for asynchronous tasks. There's going to be ones that return something. There's going to be ones that don't. There will be ones that I can interrupt the progress or report on the progress, and there's going to be ones that don't. So to demo that, I wanted to pull up just a tiny little application here, which is my feeble attempt to solve a prime number of problems. So let's go ahead and open this, and we will go to Document Slate, Windows 8, I'm sorry, Presentations, Code live and we've got this asynchronous project here so let's open that up so what this does is it uses a sort of brute force algorithm to check for prime numbers you can see this method here let's go ahead and close out this window so it's checking for a prime number and then there's a compute primes that I call into, give it a call back every time it, it finds a prime number. So when it finds it, it'll call back with that number. So on my main page, I've created a list for those prime numbers. And you can see I'm just pointing the item source to the list. And then I'm calling that compute primes with the number of primes I want to look at and my callback. So if I put a little breakpoint here, <coughs> and run this, you see I've hit my breakpoint, so I am finding prime numbers. So that's a good thing. But if I continue to run this, you're going to see I'm just sticking around in my debugger. You're not actually seeing a window. And that's because this function is blocking the user interface thread. It, it's not a good thing to block the UI thread, and in fact Windows 8 will terminate your application if you block that thread for too long, especially during startup. So what we're going to do is turn this into a task. So let's give it a public task, compute primes, async. We'll give it the same method signature. And what we'll return is this task running on a different thread? Okay, so that's all I did was I, I took this that was called directly, turned it into a task. Now on my main page on this on navigated to, remember we said that async specifies the intent to do something asynchronously. Now we can change this to compute primes async, and we can await it. The other thing I'm going to do, though, if I just ran this as is, this callback is now being called back from another thread, right, because I launched a thread here. So I want to get it back on the dispatcher. So I wanted to make this example as complicated as it could possibly be, not really, but what we want to do is make this an asynchronous callback, and then what we'll do is we'll await a call to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher gets me back on the UI thread. I can say run asynchronously, and what am I going to run asynchronously? Well, I'm going to give it a priority of normal, 
And then I'm going to take my prime numbers and add the prime number that I got back. And hopefully, if fate aligned correctly, actually, I think I need to do the async out here. Let's try that. Okay, async PR, and we probably want to do, ah, yes. We need to take out this external piece. What are we complaining about? Gets the dispatcher best overloaded, has some invalid arguments. Oh, that's right, because down here, we have an action that we're passing. Okay, we sorted it out. I believe the only thing left is to remove this extra parentheses. So let's decompose this again. I said I'm gonna wait for this without blocking the UI thread and kick this off. And then when it finds a prime number, I also wanna get asynchronous because I wanna put it on the dispatcher and wait for that to be added to the dispatcher. So this time if we run this, you can see my prime numbers start to appear right away. So even though it's still iterating and computing those prime numbers using brute force, we're not blocking the UI thread and we can start to see our results right away. And by the way, pretty good performance too here on this scroller. So let's go ahead and terminate that. And take a look at our next feature, which is touch. So I mentioned that with Windows 7, we got a set of touch APIs. Those APIs were a little different and difficult to interface with. And in fact, in Silverlight, which is where we started to write a lot of touch applications, we had to, to roll a lot of the touch functionality ourselves. Well, in Windows 8, touch is first class. All controls have it built in. There's tap, double tap, swipe, cross slide, pan, pinch, zoom plus more complicated gesture support. Now what's neat about the controls that comes with Windows 8 is that these will automatically support touch from different sources. So that's touch from a keyboard, from a mouse, from a finger, from a stylus, etc. So let's take a quick look at touch. And what I'm going to do is because I'm using my keyboard and mouse, I can't actually touch this display that I'm projecting to you. But another feature that's built in for developers is that if I open my touch application, I'm gonna navigate the, to that right now. So we'll go right here, presentations, code, Windows applications, chapter four, touch. So let's open that up. Instead of launching this directly, I'm gonna launch it through a simulator. And what the simulator does is it provides you with a UI of a tablet and it allows you to emulate touch. So ordinarily, I'd be working off my main desktop and I would remotely debug this application on my Slate tablet. Here, I've got a simulator running on my Slate tablet. And what this little graphic does, you can see pointer exit, pointer move. I can sort of click in here, drag this around a little bit. If I double click, it'll center. More importantly though, is I can do the same thing as a finger. So now I'm emulating a finger touching the display, dragging it like that. But there's more intricate touch interactions that you typically want to test. What about a pinch and zoom? Let's click on this. So now I've got two finger touch points, and I'm not sure if they're showing up uh, through the live meeting projection or not, but if I hold this and I scroll my mouse wheel, I can actually emulate pinching together, which will shrink the image, or zooming apart, which will expand the image. So let me take this off, get a little smaller pinch. And then you saw that I sort of accidentally dragged that off. So let me double click here. Actually, let's just recycle it up because I want to show you one more feature here. 
and get out of the tablet. Let's launch this one more time so I can show you the rotation piece as well. So if I come into this, I've got this object here. I'm going to click on the rotation now. I'm going to hold this down, and I'm going to scroll my mouse wheel to emulate twisting my fingers. You see I can do this full rotation. So I've got this feature set of emulating touch. I can change the virtual resolution on this virtual tablet, and I can also emulate location. So it's a pretty powerful piece of functionality for testing applications, especially if you don't have access to a touch device. Settings are another feature, which is one of the few features I've mentioned here that is a little bit more work for developers, but in the end it provides a consistent experience. And there's now a consistent way to access settings in Windows 8 applications. And I don't know if you've looked into the fact that in PowerPoint, if you want to change the options, you're going to go into File Options. But then you go to Visual Studio. And if you want to change the options in Visual Studio, you're going to go to Tools Options. I mean, there's different places that you can do this. Windows 8 provides a consistent way to handle these. And what happens is an events raise that says, I would like some commands for settings. What you return is a set of commands that say, okay, here's an action that the user can take, and when they take it, here's how I'm going to handle that. And so you can see some of the code that gives an example of setting up a preferences tab. So just to get an idea of, of what that looks like, let's go into my weather application. So you can see the great weather we're having here in Woodstock, Georgia right now. And if I pull up my charm bar, and for the charm bar, I can either swipe from the right edge of the screen, or I can hold down the Windows key and press C to get that charm bar to appear. I've got settings right here. And in these settings, I've got all of the settings for the application. So I can go into this settings, change my units, I've got permissions, etc. So it's all in one place. Let's go ahead and dismiss this application. And we can do that by just dragging it down off the screen. And let's go into, let's say, a Photos application. And if we want to find the settings for Photos, we do the exact same thing. We hold down, pull up the charm bar, go into Settings, and we've got settings for this application. You can see a, a bunch of different settings. It gives you a consistent way that the user gets used to in order to manage the settings and preferences for your application. Roaming profiles ties directly into settings, and this is seamless integration with the, the cloud. What this allows you to do is if a user's using what I'll say now is a Windows Live account, but I don't know if you've seen the announcements. This is changing, and they're really just calling it a Windows account, I believe is the new name for that. But if you're using a account that ties into SkyDrive and Live and these other services, and you use that account to log into Windows, you have the ability to use these roaming profiles. And what these allow is automatic synchronization across your devices. And so what does that mean? It means if I change a background or a setting on my slate, that I can log into my laptop and have that exact same setting synchronized. It also means, as I've experienced firsthand, if you're rebuilding a machine every time a new release of Windows 8 comes out, that most of your settings make it over to the other side. So conceptually, I took advantage of clip art because I'm not the, the greatest artist, but this is sort of what it looks like, right? You update a setting, it goes up to your Windows account in the cloud, and then synchronizes down to the other devices. What's really cool about roaming settings is the API is the exact same as the API you would use for local settings. And if you can see this code here, the local settings are setting a value, in this case current page in a, a hypothetical ebook reader, and it's using the local settings storage. All I have to do is change that to roaming settings and it'll use the roaming settings storage. Now what happens there is if the user is using a Windows account, it'll automatically synchronize. What if they're not using a Windows account? Well, then it passes through and behaves the same way as local settings, so you don't have to look for an exception or behave differently. The user is also in control on how those roaming settings operate. They can turn them off 
by application or globally, and they can also set up a plan that says, if I'm using, for example, my cellular card, I don't want data charges, so please don't roam these files while I'm over a cellular connection, as an example. Now, ICONS is, is something interesting, especially because we have a, a sponsor that's providing a, a large set that's, that's well beyond what comes native to the operating system. But uh, I mentioned already that I'm aesthetically challenged, and people probably don't want me designing their icons. I can put the code together, but, you know, drawing, not so much. Users also should have a consistent experience in these applications, right? There's nothing worse than launching a new application that's trying to hide the menu by showing you icons, and you look at these things and you say, you know, what does this do, Visual Studio? Um, so there's a lot of uh, interesting feedback with Visual Studio and changing the comments icons, for example. So we want this consistent experience. Well, on Windows 8, this, the Sego, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but the UI symbol character set provides these types of icons. And we can use this feature called character map, and again, that's showing how quickly I can pop into an application, but this allows me to explore what's available in the system, and I can scroll through and find different icons, and all I have to do is click on a particular icon, and I'll get the code that I embed in my XAML to expose that. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is a set of icons that are available, and I'm sure you can find something there that, that's functional and usable, and if you don't, the link that I give at the end of this talk will take you to the SyncFusion set that's going to extend this dramatically. So I said that if we had time, we'd go to an 11th item, and we have some time, so I'm going to share this, then I want to announce the winner of the virtual training, and then I want to conclude. But the 11th item that I found very powerful is Portable Class Library. Now, this is important to me as a former Silverlight developer, not because I'm upset that I wrote a Silverlight book and it lost popularity as I was writing the book. That's okay. We're, we're fixing that and moving on to Windows 8. A lot of people today are writing applications now, and Windows 8 is not live. So the concern is, where do I focus my technology? What do I do? What do I use? And the portable class library provides a way to bridge that gap. So you can build applications today in Silverlight for the phone, for WPF, et cetera, that you can still use tomorrow when you move to Windows 8. And what this portable class library does is it allows you to target different platforms, and then it provides you with only the APIs that exist on all of those platforms. So it's a pretty amazing feature set. So what I wanted to show you really quickly is a demo, and we won't have time to live code it. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for you. And so we'll come back to our documents, slate, presentations, code, and existing. And I'm going to pull up this generic MVVM library. So what I've done here in this application is I've created a portable library. And it's literally as easy as new project. And then in the Visual C Sharp here, you can pick a portable class library. And I've got that highlighted on the board there. And when you select that, it's going to ask you what environments you want to target. And you can pick, I'm coding for the Xbox, for the phone, etc. So in this particular example, I targeted Silverlight, WPF, and Windows 8 Metro. So what I've got here in my generic library is a command. So we're familiar with commands, and I call it a click once command, because it's a command that literally you take an action one time, and then you can no longer execute that action. I probably should have called it a tap once command, because we're in a, a touch first world, but old habits die hard, so I called it a click once command. I also provided a view model. The view model exposes a text property, with property change notification, and a click command. And this happens to be a click once command. And what happens is the initial text says click me, and then when you tap it and execute the command, it changes the text on the view model to don't click me. Very simple and straightforward, but you can see how we've got 
a little bit of logic tied up into this view model that's reusable. So if we go, for example, to Silverlight, and we look at this Silverlight project, I've got XAML that pulls in that view model and then binds a button to the text and the click command. That's all this does. There's no code behind nothing else. I'm referencing the library directly, and I'm binding the text. And so let me set this as my startup project. And we'll start debugging. And what you're going to see here, if I've got this installed, yes, is Silverlight on Windows 8 with the Click Me button that when I click it, comes disabled and says, don't click me. Okay, great. So let's close that. Let's stop it. Now let's go to WPF. It turns out in WPF, let me set that as my starter project, the XAML that I use to define this button is the exact same XAML I used in Silverlight. I've got a different background brush, and I'm actually I'm inside the Metro example. Let's go to the main window for WPF, pull that up. But you'll see it's the exact same. I pulled in the view model, and then I bound to the text and the click. So we'll set that as our startup project, and we'll run it. And without adding a new assembly, this does not have to recompile. It's the exact same view model and command assembly. What I'll get is a WPF application with a click me button that when I click it, turns to don't click me and disables itself. And then finally, within Metro, if we take a look at the Metro XAML, we've got the exact same XAML except for this background theme brush. In the view model, again, the button that binds, that almost sounds like a movie title, right? The button that binds. But let's go ahead and launch this locally. And same assembly in the background that I used in Silverlight and WPF. Click me, don't click me. So you can see we've got this. Now, I don't want to give the impression that all of your code is instantly portable, because it's not. What the portable class library does, though, is it exposes what is common between those different environments. So you can take things like your models, like your behaviors, you can build them in a way that's referenceable from the phone, from Silverlight, from WPF, and then eventually from Metro applications. So it's a very powerful feature and piece of functionality. So just to recap, so the, the 10 features that I'm excited about in the 11th bonus, the development language support, the fact that I can still use XAML, HTML5 works, JavaScript works fine. We can use third-party libraries. We've got a new Windows runtime that's unmanaged code, but I don't have to do strange things like pinvoke and a bunch of ritual and ceremony to access these. They're there for me right out of the box. I've got these cool contracts that allow me to share things between applications without even knowing anything about the application I'm sharing with. I've got asynchronous support. I've got touch first and a bunch of controls that automatically for me manage this idea of using a mouse or a keyboard or a stylus or my finger to navigate an application. We've got consistent settings, the ability to roam profiles and files. It's not just settings, but actual files. We've got icons, and then we've got this portable class library that I just talked about. So the first thing I want to announce is our lucky winner for the Windows, or I'm sorry, for the Windows, uh, taking on a little bit more than I anticipated, the Wintelect virtual training. And the winner is Liam McNamara. And I apologize if I didn't pronounce the last name correctly. That's M-C-N-A-M-A-R-A. And so I found out from Brian, one of our, our hosts, that Liam has attended almost 30 of these LinkedIn.net developer users group, otherwise known as LigNug events. So that's pretty cool. So Liam, if you can email Bethany, her mail address is, is up here on the slide, bvenandawintelect.com. She will get back to you with those details for that virtual training event. Speaking about those events, I've got a couple short uh, URLs for you to use. Uh, both on Bitly, one is the Wintelect events, and that will take you to a page that shows all of our upcoming Wintelect events. 
Of course, the icons that I spoke about are available. That's the bit.ly slash sync icons. That's a short URL that will take you directly out to download those icons. The slide deck you're looking at right now is available from Wintelect. That's wintelect.com slash downloads slash metro webinar. And then finally, the Windows 8 book. What I decided to do this time around is create a Facebook page. So many things change as you're writing a book, whether it's early release, where you host the source, you know, what you're covering. So I create a page, but it's more than just about the book. Any Windows 8 links I find that I think are interesting or of note, I post to that page. So if you go to on.fb.me, that's a, a short link for Facebook, slash Win8 book, that'll take you to that page. Of course, I would love it if you like it. If you don't, don't. And uh, you can find some great Windows 8 information there. And that takes me to the end of my slideshow. I only saw one question pop up during the talk, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to our, our host, Brian, here. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. That was um, quite an in-depth uh, presentation here. Um, very, very well put together. I definitely enjoyed that. There is uh, one question here. Uh, Oleg is asking if the code, if his code samples are download available. There are code samples downloadable. Now, most of these code samples are, are based on, so for example, the Hello World ones, because they just had one tag. Um, uh, actually, those are there too. If you go to, and I should have put this link up, but uh, I apologize, but I'll, I'll say it right now. It's real easy. Windows 8 applications. So just spell that out, Windows 8 applications, no spaces, dot codeplex, C-O-D-E-P-L-E-X dot com. Windows 8 applications dot codeplex dot com. That's the page where all of the samples I'm building for my book are available. You don't have to do anything special. It doesn't matter if you haven't bought the book or even looked at it. You can go there, download all the source. I think I have to do Chapter 5, and that includes most of the examples you saw here. So I developed a lot of these as a result of, of writing that. And um, we've got seven chapters of code samples, but six and seven I'm still converting, going through that fun of moving from the consumer preview to the release preview. Thanks, thanks for that. And uh, when is the, the book uh, completely released? Has it been released already? Okay, so on Safari Rough Cuts, which there's a link from that Facebook page, People can sign up today and get the book in electronic format. It's still being edited, tech reviewed. There's still more chapters, but what Rough Cuts does is provides early access. So you can see it as it's being written. You can also provide feedback where we keep, you know, very close attention to what people want to see. So if you pull it up and you say, I want more of this or less of that, we'll take that into account as we're developing it. For it to go to a final production in print, ready to buy, you know, fresh out of the bookstore or off Amazon.com, for example. That target is October, which we hope, and I don't know. I don't have this information, but I'm guessing based on the rumors that that should coincide closely with Windows 8 gets out there as well. Thanks for that. Uh, there's, there's another question here. Uh, it is, since the WinRT is unmanaged code, are we losing out on the advantages offered by the CLA, such as garbage collection, memory allocation, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so um, when you go with the managed code, you, you do get a managed environment. Uh, however, some people would argue that native code allows for more closer to the metal performance tweaks. Now, I'm not a gaming developer, so I'm going to be transparent and, and just say that, that I'm not the right person to, to speak to those in depth. What happens, though, is when you use the managed code, you do get a dependency on the .NET framework that you don't have in unmanaged code. However, having said that, when you're using C++, the compiler has extensions for C++ 
for the objects that you reference in your Windows 8 applications. And so it does a lot behind the scenes. For example, there's this concept of reference counting that we use. And that reference counting is, is part of the extensions. And again, I'm not going to talk too much more because I'm getting out of my realm of, of expertise. But my understanding is the extensions do a little bit of that for you. So really, the decision to go between uh, C++ or C Sharp, manage or unmanage, should be either A, if there's some performance issue that really needs that, that direct uh, C++ code, which I have not heard of people running into, but again, I'm not a, a games developer, that would be one. But two is just what is your language preference? Whatever language you're comfortable with. So if you are an unmanaged developer who knows your way around C++, that's the, the way I would go. If you go with HTML5, for example, you take a dependency on, on the web rendering engine and the, the JavaScript, uh, host, right, to do that. But so far, I haven't seen anyone say that any of the language selections results in performance issues. It's more a preference of, of what is the language that you code well in. And there's more questions. They're actually coming in now in a row. There's one here. Uh, according to to JavaScript application model on Win8, the working application on Metro is IE10. Um, the question here is, how can we write write like the tiles? I mean, the tiles running while they're in icon mode. So I guess there's, there's a couple of things I'm hearing for that question. If I don't answer it well, let me know. So IE10 is the host. It's the rendering engine. And then WinJS provides the bridge to the underlying operating system. You get the same templates and the same uh, controls. And mostly, uh, there's slight differences. But for the most part, you have uh, similar things in your language choice. Now, you're not actually running in the web browser. That's very important. It's a special host for Windows 8 that hosts the application. So you're not going to be able to navigate to, to any type of page. Now, when you're looking at those tiles that are on the start screen, those are hosted by the operating system itself. So we don't actually program the start screen tiles in any language. Those are in a format or an API that you communicate with. And it's actually a very straightforward API. You basically send XML to a Windows runtime component, and that XML says, I want to use a template with an image, or I want one that animates, or I want one that's text, and you give it the values for the template, and it renders that live tile. So you get that same functionality of an interactive tile, regardless of which language you choose, and updating the tile is really just formatting some XML and sending it to a Windows runtime API. I think that answered the question, definitely. Otherwise, uh, get back to me again. Um, there's another one here. According to JavaScript application model number 8. Uh, oh, no, that's the same one. Sorry. <laughs> Is the WinRT class call from Metro JavaScript supported on Mac browser or only Windows? Right. So everything I've shown is supported through a Windows 8 operating system. So none of the, even the HTML examples would not be runnable through a Mac browser because even though HTML and JavaScript is used as the language to build the application, the host that's actually rendering it and provides all the capabilities is the Windows 8 operating system. So those examples are fully runnable on Windows 8, but they're not examples you could run in a web browser. Thank you, and we have more coming. <laughs> uh, is it some, a full SAML stack? Uh, does it support full 3D and all the other good stuff we know SAML can do? And that's from Peter Shaw. Right, so the, there's no uh, a parity with, uh, for example, the WPF 3D libraries. Uh, even in Silverlight, when we got 3D there, it was a XNA type of uh, surface area. So, a, again, not my area of, of expertise. I, I work mostly on line of business applications. But my understanding on Windows 8 is there's a direct X model 
uh, for doing intensive graphics operations. So you have Direct 2D and you have Direct 3D. So what you get is regardless of the technology you're choosing, you'll get a surface that you render to. And then on that surface, you can render your 2D or 3D effects using that direct uh, set of APIs. Do, do you think, uh, just a uh, follow do you think that stack is going to increase considering that the, the assembly team is now under the Windows 8 team? So, uh, you know, I have mixed, mixed feelings about that, and here's why. A lot of the limitations people see on, on the stack are ways that they drove the functionality sort of above and beyond. And at the end of the day, Windows 8 really is a, a – Metro is a, a – I don't want to say a limited sandbox, but it is a different paradigm than, say, a freeform desktop application. So what I see is a lot of parity between XAML being used as the UI markup language on the C Sharp, C++, VB side, and then HTML being markup on the other side. So my guess is that we may see more rich features to support UI constructs on the XAML side, but I don't think we'll see things like markup extensions and other types of, of features that are more non-UI focused, right, that are more application stack focused, because the idea is really this is the design language, and then you're using the Windows Runtime API for the code behind. I could be completely wrong and off base. That doesn't represent, you know, a, a official Microsoft opinion, but my sense is the stack will evolve. We've seen it already evolve just between developer preview and release preview. But I think it's going to focus on making developers' lives easier with presenting these metro design style applications and not necessarily to extend functionality just because we're used to it on the desktop side. Yeah, that makes that makes, uh, makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, do, do you think uh, for for the future, look at HTML5 uh, and SAML, uh, which one do you think is going to be the more popular choice uh, for applications that are not Metro exclusive? <laughs> you know, that that's tough to say. I think it depends on adoption. I think a lot of the, the people who are producing applications today are familiar with the XAML stack moving on to Windows 8, but I think the whole notion of HTML5 is two-pronged. One is the thought that, you know, people on other platforms who may not have traditionally built for Windows can now come over. They need to learn the API, but the way they mark up the page and use JavaScript will be familiar. So that's one. And two is... Even those of us who know the XAML stack, we know that most of the big applications we're building for customers are, are web technologies. So as we get more embedded in HTML5 and JavaScript, we might not want to keep thrashing and switching, right, between one markup and, and the other. So I think it's hard to say there's a lot of support for XAML. I don't see it going away soon because it's just a very clean, nice way. But I do see HTML5 gaining popularity. So I think, you know, one, two years down the road, you could certainly see that. But remember, too, taking on HTML5 means using JavaScript as the language choice. And I think there's even more support for C Sharp, Visual Basic, and C++'s language choices. And with those choices, you have to take XAML as the markup language. So I think that's what's going to kind of make both go neck and neck and not really give us a clear winner overall. Um, we've still got a few in there, Jeremy, I think. Uh, Asset asking, what's the biggest advantage in using VS was developer experience? Are we compromising? I'm trying to understand the question. What is the biggest? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure myself either. <laughs> <laughs> Advantages. I mean, I, I've been using... Uh, 2012, not just for Windows 8, we've got some, some projects, uh, some pretty big uh, production projects that we're using it. And for the most part, we're finding a lot of features that just make development easier. And that's kind of been the case, right? We get third-party tools that extend the functionality, and then Microsoft collapses them into the next version of, of the IDE. And, and there's always third-party tools that sort of lead the curve. But this is, is definitely... A, uh, a feature set that's easy to get around, has a lot of great language features, has a lot of new integration. I know there's been some thrash about mm. you know, the Metro interface and the colors and everything else, but the usability, I think, is, is very, 
good and solid with Visual Studio. Well, we've just got time for these last two questions, I think, if you're up for answering them, and then we'll call it a wrap. All right, sounds good. Um, Jaya is asking, if one is coding in C Sharp, would it help if we were well acquainted with Win32 API to be able to better write Metro apps? Not at all. So this uh, concept of projection uh, makes it available to your application as a traditional C Sharp. So it's just like programming against the base class library, whether you're opening a stream or dealing with the file system, everything looks and feels in C Sharp like a C Sharp type or class. So there is no need to understand Win32.com or any of the underlying technologies. And that's the beauty of it is they've leveraged it in the background, but they've made it completely transparent to what we do as C Sharp developers. And last one, what was the URL you used to copy the buttons Metro styles again? And that was Eriki. Okay, I don't have the URL memorized, but if you Bing search Silverlight button template, so those three words, Silverlight button template, the first result should be the MSDN page that has the template on it. Great stuff. Well, um, yeah, I think that's all for today. Um, we've hit the one and a half hour mark just over. Um, thank you once again for coming and doing another excellent presentation for us. Um, I think at some point we should really make you an honorary member of Lidnug staff because this is now your second or your third presentation. And I think you've got a fourth one coming up as well. Um, uh, I do. It's getting exciting. I'm chasing after... <laughs> Uh, I'm chasing after Liam, so he's attended 30. I want to present 30, and then we'll just... <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sure we can arrange that, but thank you once again, um, Jeremy. Fantastic content, as always, we've come to expect from you. Um, Winterlecker, fantastic for being behind it, and all the members of Lidnug staff that were in the uh, house today as well. Great, fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Had a great time, and always enjoy these events. Great stuff. And we'll stop there.